Uh, so the cold weather has hit us here. We, we're down around three degrees today. At least six this morning we were. Uh, <clears throat> we're in northern New Hampshire, so you'd expect that. It's, uh, we're not in Canada. I was in school up in Canada for a while, and that was cold. That was seriously cold and snowy up in Alberta. Uh, all right. Uh, manner, style. Here's, here I am. Um, so, and I apologize to the person who sent me this because I can't find it again. And I think it's when you email me that I <laughs> lose track of these. I normally will take the the uh, the question you or proposal you have and, and and copy it and put it in a particular place and have it on the on the end of the list so I can just grab it. And for the second time, I didn't do that with this one. So, whoever you are, you asked about. Um, um, you asked me to consider Philip DeLaszlo, and Philip DeLaszlo gets attraction, uh, gets gets attention because um, of the book he wrote about painting. But um, and he says many of the things, of course, that you would hear in a in a, in a from a well trained person. But um, uh, as I said before, his work doesn't quite stack up to you know to that level you want it to, in my view, and I decided to do, instead of talking about him in a way that was in any way disparaging, I wanted to just talk about this idea of, of um, manner, mannerisms, uh, uh, and, and style, and stylization. So, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and then, uh, then I'll talk a little bit about uh, Philip DeLaszlo. I don't have much to say about him. I have other friends, and, you know, when we were young, we, 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 it was one of the books you could find, so we, we had... Um, conversations about him. Um, back in those days, it was much more difficult to get a hold of a lot of uh, reproductions. And in today's uh, review, I was looking at reproductions of Watteau, and I was very surprised, very pleasantly surprised to see how many really top pictures he painted. Um, uh, he's in my list because there's a tendency of people around that era in the 1700s to turn to turn mannerist uh, a little bit. And uh, so I'll talk about some of those people and uh, but uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, I found a lot more work of uh, Philip DeLaszlo, and it doesn't hold up well. Um, so, uh, but th this is an intriguing question. You know, the question of whether or not we are, uh, or, or or the level of truth that we are we are um, presenting, how significant truth is in painting. And whether it has an effect on your standing as a great painter, and uh, what is this thing you know we call style, or what are these, what are mannerisms, or and what is style? Is it well anyway? So let's just talk about those things as as they come up. Um, I grabbed a bunch of pictures. The first ones that came to mind again, I don't, uh, I didn't go looking for trouble. You know, I don't go find books on stylization or manner or anything. Like style, I mean style or manner or anything like that. I just live with my. My own long looking and and uh, and remember again every time I talk to you I'm talking about what I've seen with my eyes, and uh, on some levels uh, what I've um, what I have um, uh, read or heard or had conversations about with say someone like Gamel, some knowledgeable person. But um, uh, I'm, I'm going to start with Michelangelo. Uh, the, the the Renaissance had a number of people who were uh, trying to figure out painting, trying to figure out uh, how to draw. And all that sort of thing. Michelangelo was one of them, and uh, Michelangelo was one of those first people you look at as having a self-created uh, figure. I say, of course, everybody around him, Botticelli, all those guys were making up their own figures, pretty much, and uh, so they were coming up with an idea. Uh, idea. Why well, you might call it an ideal figure, but not to present an idea as much as to be a good one, a good working model, say for the average man. If <clears throat> If you're doing paintings, do you remember that comment about from Michelangelo? Somebody asked, said it doesn't look much like uh, Julian, uh, Julia, whatever the guy's name is, de Medici. The statue didn't. He said, uh, he said, who's going to know in thirty years? Which tells you something about his 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 mentality. Uh, he was trying to create a monument, uh, which becomes rather a symbol of a man more than it's a portrait of a man. And that model, I think, uh, is frequent in his work. And so I'm going to show you these couple pictures here. Um, they show this sort of strange tendency to, I say strange, but I mean, when you're making up your own figure, but this, the fact that they had the guts to literally go through and draw every muscle on a figure 
try, having tried having sort of self created this thing, and uh, that's pretty impressive. And it's there. Of course, I'm not saying that sounds pretty low to me to say that about Michelangelo because of his standing, and I and I certainly don't mean in any way to 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 uh, to make pretenses about who I am or who anybody is in relation to the world. But Michelangelo is a big and important, huge figure. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if there's any been ever been a greater piece of sculpture than the, um, you know, the dead Christ on the lap of the uh, Madonna, um, uh, or the uh, or Mary, uh, and that, uh, you know, the the exquisite skills involved in that sort of thing. Of course, he referred to himself as not a painter when he was assigned this job of painting these walls here, but I wanted to show you. And here I am again, failing on somebody to get you that arrow. Oh, gee, I didn't mean to look that up, but I ran out of time today, so I have an excuse. But you can see that what he's doing here is he's creating rather a symbolic character. So this is a Libyan Sybil, somebody out of history. He is intend to be a monument to you know to the prophets or to a to uh, or to uh, you know men of myth, you know. And on some level, so of course, is the Christ figure. You know, this is a figure that Christ is, is in nowhere represented as being this muscle man who's this manly guy that everybody wants to emulate in terms of his physical stature. Uh, the scriptures say he, he uh, had no comeliness that we should desire him. That's an interesting difference, right? But when you start painting symbolically, then Christ takes on this thing about being part of the Godhead, of, of, Christ, of being. Um, of being more than man, or being man plus, and so that suddenly, all, all of a sudden, you know, you take on the idea of expressing power through his figure. Anyway, but you understand that these, this class of, of figure is, uh, this class of painting is called idealizing. You are painting to a purpose. You're, you're making people a specific thing to a purpose. Now, before, when he's imagining the figures in the first place, when he's coming up with his ideal man. That isn't the same thing. Uh, Bouguereau does that, for example, with a face or even a figure where he paints the same figure all the time because it's his, you know, Bouguereau just happens to resort to the, to the uh, nature more frequently. These guys appeared not to have had access to uh, nude figures uh, as much. Apparently, not at all. It certainly didn't work directly from them much by the look of these paintings. But, uh, but nevertheless, you, you hear people like Millet, and there are plenty of others who are painting figures out of their head, memory-based figures. And so this is enormously impressive stuff. But that's not what I mean. When I'm talking about style now, I'm talking about the idea of creating a stylization of something that will represent something as a monument or a symbol. So, and I'm going to show you uh, Ang for the same exact reason. Here, Ang has done the, the uh, harem. Now, Ang is the most brilliant stylizer <laughs> possibly anywhere. Uh, at one point, and if anybody can find this for me, I'd love to have it again. At one point, I was looking at a, a, a Gazette de Beaux Arts, an original copy of one of these 1800s magazines in the um, in the um, Boston Athenaeum Library that Gamble so kindly gave us tickets to, um, and 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 I found this this uh, article about Ang and his students, and it showed, I think, as many as five different figure drawings from five different years. And it showed how he went from having you draw an accurate figure and then getting quite good at it as you went along to actually then beginning to do something that you would call idealization. Well, all of a sudden, the figure begins to take on a different quality than nature itself had. There's a certain borrowing of your ideas, right, to win in the creation of your figure. Well, Ang does this like nobody. I mean, he really made a science of it. And you can see when he teaches a student to do it, he's effective. Uh, now that you can ever figure out whether he meant a particular idea in relation to that figure he does show there, for example, if it was by um, if it was by one of his students, he 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 might have been working on a picture f that this was for, and therefore been encouraged to model in a certain way. Um, uh, to, uh, this is what we would call slight deviations from nature. Well, in this case here, Ang is painting a Persian subject. <laughs> Remember, this, this is the era of the Orientalist, so he's an early Orientalist, isn't he? Perhaps. So he's painting the excuse for a nude, right? The the harem girl or the odalisk, and you can. But you can see here th these are two examples of of Persian art, and you can see the stylizations. The uh, the of course the costume and all that sort of stuff would be the case, but the stylizations of the fingers, even things like that. I don't know if I found any fingers in these, but but the the, the stylizations all through this drawing. But you can feel without even looking hard at it, in significant part. Uh, the perspective, this flat-on perspective, all this stuff, 
but he's doing what you'd call the, 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 the Persian ideal. He's painting, as it were, a Persian painting, of course, with Western <laughs> input, you know, like, like he wouldn't give up on three-dimensional form as much as these guys did. Uh, but, um, but you can see the idealization of the face. You can see these very interesting sim simplifications. And uh, so this is stylization. Now here he's doing it on, on, uh, on earlier French subjects. And I'm trying to remember, I have not been able to remember who the French uh, painter is. I want to say Gerard or somebody like that, but that wouldn't be right. I think he's the same era as... But some, some, some French artist from another era, here you are painting medieval and this looks medieval. Whatever, whatever his look is, if it's a, from a painting, it's one thing. But the fact is he's, he gives you the characterization of these guys to make the whole thing feel like it was from that era instead of looking like it was real people. Like the Christ, I mean, the um, Bougro does Christ being the flagellation of Christ, and it looks like a bunch of guys. You know, they, they don't look like guys from, from ancient uh, Israel. And uh, so that's, a, that's what happens as you get into realism and you start sticking to the model and not knowing how to do what Ang is doing here. So understand, I'm talking about stylization now. And um, not a style of painting, but stylization in painting. So here he was a huge fan, as everyone should know, about of, of Raphael. You know, he would have been a Raphaelite as opposed to a pre-Raphaelite. And uh, so, so Raphael did this, and Ang did this, and uh, you can see the colors are the same and all the rest of that. But there's, there's so many aspects of his mannerisms, including the way of making fingers and all that sort of thing, that are, that are in the class of what, um, of what uh, Raphael is doing. And then here he's painting, a, this is Ang, painting a portrait of Raphael in the Foreign Arena. And you'll see that same uh, stylization uh, throughout. And so what we're seeing here is a guy who knows how to, to borrow Raphael. And of course, when he does portraits, there's a little bit of that, but, but uh, it, he doesn't it get stuck to it when he's doing portraits of men, for example. I don't see Raphael there. Now, I mean, I see Raphael as, what is that famous portrait of Raphael? But, but um, Ang's a consummately great uh, portrait painter, by the way. Um, and it isn't because of his Raphaelisms, which do tend to hang on him. And that would be what I call style, by the way, to the extent that you're trying, your whole way of working has borrowed everything from somebody else. That's in the direction of style. Uh, so, now here's El Greco, the most famous, of course, of all mannerists. And so, a manner, this is a question, right? Whether or not, these are, you know, the, the, the way of painting and that sort of thing, these are called mannerists. And this whole idea that this isn't a real space, these people, these figures are elongated, are curious in odd ways. And uh, so, the argument, the question is whether or not he's trying to do this to, as it were, spiritualize the content. Uh, you know, to sort of remove it one step from the look of nature, literally, so it's not real people and that sort of thing, and to give it a spiritual quality. I think of uh, Innes, George Innes, when I think of that idea of trying to spiritualize. Um, but you can see the distortions in this sort of thing, and so this this would become a classic mannerism. All of his work isn't like this. You knew you know that he didn't have to paint this way. Uh, but this is a mannerism, and, you know, people like Sargent, Sargent loved... Uh, 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 something about El Greco, and I don't remember what he said, and that would be a nice one to look up, if anything. Uh, he liked Tenoretto, uh, who had some of the same tendencies to go a little uh, extravagant on the sweeping this and the, you know, and the, um, uh, I don't know if it's grandiosity style, style in the sense of making a, a, a statement thing. Um, I may be saying too much. I want you just to look at this and say, look, that is not the same thing <laughs> as what you see, well, let me go through him and I'll say, well, let me go jump over too. That's not the same thing as what you see here in, um, in Van Dyck, is it? So, and it's definitely not what you see in, in, in Titian. This is truth all the time, isn't it? Titian's impressive that way. Titian is also that guy who, when he paints the, the Rape of Europa, the woman riding on the back of the horse, it looks like, you know, like the leg looks like it <laughs> with a certain fatty tissue on the leg and that sort of thing. It looks like it could have been your, your, his, his, his girlfriend's aunt or whatever, his, his wife. But, uh, I mean, it was like he very much is in that camp of borrowing more from the actual figure than these guys who make up their own figures. But uh, when you get to, um, but when you're talking about, uh, so again, Rubens, now you're talking about this era, which is the Baroque, the Rococo, whatever you want to call this. And you, I, I often think of these, these pillars when I think of these women here. Right? It's, 
so it's, this is what you might call a stylization, but a stylization based on a style of the times, based on Rococo. Or who knows to what extent he leads Rococo, right? I don't actually know dates, and I've never tried to sort that out. It's probably, there's a tendency for styles to happen sort of simultaneously with painters and sculptors and other people working. Uh, for some reason, that comes out in the same time frame. But this thing, even <laughs> this little look, this little whatever this thing is, canopy is so 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 much like this. It's almost like he could have taken the idea of these women from that actual object. But you can see what I mean by uh, uh, so. His, but his whole entire way of working, Rubens, is is as it were false. He makes up these figures. By the way, I would say that that um, the difference between him and and um, and uh, Michelangelo is that Michelangelo isn't purposely uh, false. Like, in other words, it doesn't look like, even though both of them invented their figure, you get the sense that he's making something up here that's, you know, I'm, I'm probably reaching, but it's that's that, that's going to be convenient for him to draw over and over again. I mean, like with, with Michelangelo, all the men have muscles, um, and the women are, are of a certain, shall we say, voluptuousness. And... Um, but there's a certain weakness in them, there's a certain falseness. And that's, of course, he's doing an, a, an invented figure. And he seems to frequently be applying the invented figure idea to the, um, uh, to the figure, to the painting, to the entire painting, and uh, even a portrait. And therefore, he loses a step to the truth, right? And that was the, that's sort of the subject. That's the question about this whole thing about style versus truth. <laughs> And at what point does style actually inhibit you from reaching the top echelons of great painting? So I point out um, Van Dyck to you, though, because Van Dyck actually uh, looks like he was using models consistently more. Uh, and I don't think that means he was exclusively painting for models. I don't think that's actually true, but based on the number of drawings there are, which are lots. But um, maybe in a model more, a little more like Ang's, where there'd be a lot of drawing and models. Uh, but you can see here that there's a considerable, great, even this one, which is very Rubin-like, it's considerably more true. Uh, in other words, he hasn't embellished. Uh, so you see how it feels. It feels like a cartoon, and that feels actually like the great mainstream of Western art. And not picking on, on him, just tell you what I see. This is one of the great, this is the portrait of, uh, I think it's Gitza, one of the great portraits of all time. It's the head is about this size and a if you'd made the whole area of the right side of my me, there's a little teeny guy in the middle, perfectly placed in the middle of a picture <laughs> like this. Uh, one of the great, great, great portraits of all time. Really astonishing piece of work. The first time you see it as a young person, it's just mind blowing. But again, that mo that's much more modeled on the Titian on the Titian model, and um, Titian was enormously dedicated to truth. He had that mix of things, you know, he was painting pictures where he's piecing it together out of out of stuff and things, right? He undoubtedly didn't pose anybody. Oh, he posed sitters, but there's no likelihood that he posed this, this sitter outdoors or the background of this and that and then painted an impressionist picture. He was still putting pictures together. Uh, but you can see the, the lack of a, what you might call a manner in this work here. Uh, <clears throat> We got a rocking tabletop here. All right, and so now let's talk about Franz Hals just a bit later. Franz Hals comes in the door, and Franz Hals is a very, very strong painter. Really, really great for that time, portrait painter in particular. Uh, most, in fact, almost entirely, I think. Uh, and here you have uh, what happens, though. There's discussions about him, I think Kenyon Cox and others, but about what happens when he becomes, when he starts being an exaggeration of himself. His way of working talks, of, or People talking about him talk about this way of working that he had, putting out a stroke and leave it and all that sort of thing. But at some point, it rather becomes a mannerism. And uh, that's all I mentioned Franz Hals for. But you get to Fragonard, and look at that. He's Again, he's, he's inventing figures. Uh, he, he may have models or may not, but if he has, he's actually using, just deviating from the model enormously right away. There's two um, sort of subject pictures. I don't think this is a portrait of anybody he knew. Maybe a picture of himself, I don't know. But he's chosen to cartoon himself, much like maybe Orpen did in those portraits we've looked at. Uh, but you can see that this is what we may as well call a, a serious mannerism or style. Um, and I say style now taking over the power of truth. Now I'm going to jump you over to Watteau, who's a painter of the same time. 
This guy's painting similar kinds of themes, at least apart from the nude thing there, but look how powerful these Watos are. Look how truthful they are. They're staggeringly beautiful pictures. And uh, in that sense, you know, look, he doesn't have, he's not overwhelmed by truth in nature, but look what he has, you know. You see, they think of Claude Lorraine too. So again, this becomes a little more like cartooning, and of course, the style's heavy on it. The style dominates truth. And um, uh, it, yeah, dominates truth. Think of it that way. So I'm just going to show you some other style, what we know as styles. This is the Art uh, Nouveau style. So you recognize Aubrey Beardsley in the bottom here. This is a sculpture. I don't know who did this, but Rodin has a little bit of that, but not a huge amount of it. And then, of course, uh, the, uh, Czech, uh, the Czech painter, whose name is now deciding to exit my brain, that you all know. So, you know, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, sorry about that. But that's the Art Nouveau style, and one of them, one of the Americans was heavy. It was heavy on him. Now again, I'm going to tell you just to look at it, get the feeling of it. You see, there's a certain sweeping something and a certain embellishment in a very uh, um, finessed kind of a way in in, in places, um, and um, but that combination. And I've shown you other works by by um, by John White Alexander, um, but the um, uh, oh gee, I just about had the other painter's name. Um, but the um, but this whole this whole sweeping abstraction is you just look at it easily. Don't look into it. Just look at it without looking hard, and you can feel the art uh, nouveau thing. And I think it's heavy on Sargent as well. But Sargent ha ha actually, and by the way, this guy is not sacrificing truth for it. He just gets it in the painting itself. By the way, one might, in part, you know, you might find a fold or two in here when you're painting. You would anyway, by the way, painting drapery. And that just needed to be placed over a little further or something to get your rhythms right or to be curved a little bit more. So this still would have un undoubtedly been set up from life. And uh, it would have had to perform as an Art Nouveau line before he would have started painting it. So he's not just, he's not just drawing this thing, making up this thing, and then gluing nature back into it. There's no evidence that White worked that way. Uh, Alexander, I mean. So here's the Art Deco thing. And you all recognize this, right? It's got something... <laughs> I think there's something a little bit fascist about it, what we always think. That's that era, right, when we're talking about people like Mussolini. <laughs> and, but, um, but that grandiose art of some of, the, some of Europe's um, uh, tyrants um, uh, would, be, would be kings, so to speak. Um, they, there's this thing about making monuments, but this, there's something monumental about this. They're great statements. That's, they're, they're, very, they're very strong on making a really excellent pattern and an entertaining pattern in the in the cutout sort of sense, and these pictures tend to have a sort of a flat look, a flattened out look. Even from whichever side you look at it, they tend not to have this feeling. And they do, by the way, to me, feel like they ought to be viewed primarily from one spot. Um, they are at their best, at, at, as compared with other people who may be seen or work to be seen to be to be designed from multiple spots. And this uh, Olympica, if you didn't know Olympica on the left, two pictures. Uh, she's the, she's the, to me, she's the representational painter, uh, 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 Art Deco representational painter par excellence. You know, she really embodies the idea. And again, I think I've mentioned to you guys, watch uh, <laughs> Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow if you want to see what I mean by the Art Deco line. It's a movie, uh, very amusing movie, pleasant movie um, for all ages. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, and this is uh, Fetchin. And here again, this is where you can start seeing. And by the way, this is you might call this Art Deco style. And whereas this one here, it just simply is heavy with his hands, his style. So you can see him sacrificing truth to nature frequently for his for his paint look and that sort of thing. And that's where we get to this question of sort of the artsy thing that sort of takes over. For a lot of people, that they believe that what they're doing when they do art is this personal statement of something weird on the surface or something different on the surface. And I wouldn't argue, though, that there's a, an element of, uh, you know, your own personal touch. There's, an, there's a certain amount of your own... When you see nature, there are these things that evolve that you, when you see them, you want to make sure it can be seen. And so you might isolate other things for the sake of that. Uh, like in the ideas of lost and found stuff, you might isolate other things or leave them out for the sake of that thing that you're seeing, that, you're, that, that visual music that you're trying to bring across. So, um, so now we get down to uh, uh, Philip de Laszlo, and I'm putting him in the same camp as Boldini. Both of them seem to be 
Well, I think Baldini is almost literally the same time as Sargent, so you can understand what's going on. So lots of people were painting. But these have that same feeling of Sargent as being these statement pieces, right, where you're trying to make the woman just do this action thing or this great, you know, Vogue magazine cover statement. Uh, uh, really, Philip de Laszlo has none of that. He, his method appears to be uh, uh, borrowed, meaning it's Sargent, but his color isn't particularly good, and there's a certain shallowness to it that turns this whole thing into a, a mannerism, because, what I call the Sargent manner. And that to me is the sort of the, the bad thing when you start getting to that place where we're talking about painting with somebody else's style, and now you do some mannered version of that thing. Uh, instead of having being most being directly evolved from nature yourself, you're now being art borrowing art, art. Art, I mean, art instead of imitation of nature, art and imitation of art, and that's what people people talk about the decline when you start more representing what the guys that did before you do than you do this. You know, yourself, yourself study, yourself uh, uh, evolution, yourself development before nature. But no, I so I think a lot of people. I know a lot of people have. And a lot of people in our time are trying to paint Sargentine little portraits and stuff and because it's got a certain flair to it. And, uh, and so you can make a living at it. And he painted a lot of portraits of rather important people, um, De Laszlo did. But none of them have that ability to get up above what Sargent was doing, or I don't think even to get close. And I think that's partially because of this tendency to be a borrower instead of an original. So that's just me being answering that question uh, briefly as I can. Um, but now I want to show you one last piece. This is it. This is the mannerism versus the <laughs> truth. Here you, here you have Monet finding that this pursuit of truth, of light and color, needed to be done with broken color. It needed, it actually was, this, gave you this massive, it gave you these massive advantages for searching out color, color movements, color play, getting notes down, like in a field, and, and, and broken color bits here, bits there, and starting to get them integrated into each other, related into each other, beautifully related into each other. But when you go to Surat, and I don't know before or after any, I don't know where he lands and all this, and I think it, the discussions you see about Surat make it look like he was much more involved in the science of magazine printing, point, you know, the point, the point making color in, 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 in magazine printing, you know, in, uh, in, in the printing medium. But what happens after you see three or four of these is you begin to realize that the manner, there's a mannerism here. This doesn't feel like a mannerism. It feels like a method. But this feels like a mannerism. Now, it doesn't mean that it's without truth, although it isn't heavy on The truth isn't heavy on it. By the way, even painting in a very, 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 very light key tends, winds up being something like a mannerism. It can be. Um, but... Um, is, but that's a king of painting is king of painting, and it could be that you found a certain kind of beauty sitting out there, where you're overwhelmed by the sort of the brilliance of the, or the, shall we say, the light, the general lightness of the day. That so that would be called the general tonality of the picture. You want a key to it, and that's perfectly fine. But um, but the, but what I am saying here though is I believe this this has that feeling when I say mannerism. This feels like if you do too many of these, by the time you've done, time you've done three or four hundred of these things you'll be known by this manner, this pointless manner. Now, you can say uh, uh, Monet is known by this broken color thing, but the fact is, if you're a student of Monet and you really are looking at the deeply into him, what you're going to find is he's a master of truth when it comes to color and light. Uh, the mastery here is staggering, staggering <laughs> by any account when it comes to the world of color and light. And, uh, and you know, these, the, as I said, if, it, he's not just winding up doing an imitation of himself, self-plagiarizing over and over and over. His whole world is a little bit like Degas, where this is an adventure. He's hunting for, no, I got to try this now. I got to try that now. It's not, still not quite working. I got too much of this. Oh, it looks like a drawing. It doesn't look like nature, you know, and so he switches out of the liney thing and gets into more of the blob and mass. But, but, but that search never quits. It's always a search for more truth, more truth. It feels like that. And of course, he doesn't abandon the idea of beauty in the sense of, I mean, in the sense of design and that sort of stuff. Uh, I, I think in the end, his best stuff isn't bad design at all. But, uh, uh, but that's in a different category, right? You see that his basic motif in life is actually powering up truth. So I would run you all the way back to that Titian and tell you to think about that with regard to this whole idea of style. Think about the great masters and wonder about that. And uh, when you're borrowing, borrow from, again, we'll say borrow from a millionaire, but the millionaire, the real millionaire is nature itself. 
And that's where I would send you. Oh, I forgot to thank two people for donations, Ron and uh, I think it's Nicholas. Guys, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, and, and do keep on, for, for all of you, keep on um, you know, getting what you can, talking to me about what you can't get, and, uh, and uh, giving me a chance to, to, to elaborate if, if, if you think it'd be helpful. And, uh, of course, keep on subscribing, recommending this to others by sharing and uh, liking and all the rest. Uh, make, but anyway, so thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, thank you all for this. What well, feel like Christmas donations lately, by the way. And, uh, and we'll see you in the next one.